find a lot of my patients, they really struggle with planning out their meals with regards to grocery shopping. So who here likes the grocery store again? No one, right? So trying to plan out your meals before you go to that big, evil, scary place is important. Um, otherwise, you end up scrambling for things, and that, that can cause a little bit of panic in you. What am I going to make for supper tonight? Oh, I'm going to have sloppy joes again, right? And people in your family might start saying, mm, this is the third time this week we've had sloppy joes, so maybe we need to huh, vary it up a little bit. So what we want to try and do is we want to try and use a list of some sort. So whether you have a grocery list on a pad of paper or just a scrap piece of paper that you have kind of jotting down some items, it's really, really important. I'm going to show you a, a sheet that we use here. Um, and also to remind you that meal planning can also take the stress away. So you do all the thinking at one time. You don't need to worry about planning it every single day and going through the stress and agony of making that decision every single day. You make one time in your week, you plan all the meals together, and then you can kind of free up some space in your head because, there, again, you don't, need to worry about, you don't need to worry about it for the rest of the week. But it's really important to schedule time to do this. So you don't want to do this five minutes before you actually head into the car to go to the grocery store. You also don't, don't want to do it while you're in the grocery store because it's not really the ideal place to do that. So uh, what I recommend doing is doing something like this. This is called the Eat Sheet. You can get this from a website at the very bottom of the page. It's, it, well, you can't see that. Never mind. Um, it's called mommytract.com, but there's no E in tract. So I just take the E out of it. Um, and what it is, it's a, it's a meal planning sheet. It has the days of the week on the one side and the grocery list attached to it. On the one side of the sheet, you're going to choose which meals you're going to make during the day. So if you like sloppy joes, make sloppy joes. Put them on one of the days of the week. Um, I know that in my house we have egg sandwich night because there's just not, I, don't, I don't have any ideas left. So that's usually Friday night when I get home because I'm out of ideas and I'm out of energy by then. And you're going to put them all down the side of the page where it has the days of the week on it. So the days when you have to take your kid to hockey or around the door really quickly or you have an appointment, that you can plan around those things now. So if you have a dental appointment at 4, you don't exactly have time to go home, make supper, and feed everyone by, everyone by 5. But if you had it in a crock pot, it would be ready to go when you got home. You're going to write down the items you need to buy. So when you're making a meal plan, you can also start doing instant inventory in your house as well which means that you look in the pantry so you don't end up buying five bottles of mayonnaise because even though it is non-perishable, it does eventually rot. And you also don't need to have 10 bottles of ketchup unless you really like ketchup in your house. And you can check the freezer because things, again, you should try and use up some of the stuff in the bottom of the freezer, unlike me where you put stuff on top and use the stuff on top first and everything at the bottom stays in the bottom. Some people like to buy other things at the grocery store other than what they're going to make for supper. So if you need to buy shampoo, then that's important. You can always by the shampoo at that time, and bring the list with you. So it's really important that when you're going to the grocery store, you're going to bring the list with you so that you actually don't forget the items. But the actual act of writing out the list can also be very beneficial to you because writing it out also engraves it in your memory a little bit. If you're really prone to leaving it behind, take a picture of it with your smartphone because you can always pull that up if you're there and you can always zoom in to what you wrote. Okay. If you're really, really keen as well, you can, you can shop from your flyers. So depending on what's on sale, you can maybe plan out your meals based on what's on sale at the grocery stores. And if you want a price match, you can save even with some more bucks by just going to one grocery store and using the other flyers that, that are around in the city and get the same prices that they have on sale. So you can save a few bucks. So some of my patients say, Becky, why do I do this every week? Every week I sit down and do my meal plan, and I feel like I'm doing the same thing over and over and over again. And I say, well, do it four times then and just recycle them. Just use them again. So you can have a kind of a monthly meal plan and reuse your eat sheets over and over and over again. Some people also like to plan out breakfast or they like to plan out lunch as well because sometimes on the weekends you have to organize those things. Or if you have little kids in school, you have to plan out their lunches as well. So it's important to try and plan out everything you need to. And again, the website's there for the, the one um, each sheet. And you can also use Get Buttoned Up is, is linked to the Mommy Tracked website. So that's a way of looking at other organizational sheets you can use. And we're going to look at one of the ones from Get Buttoned Up later on. And again, sometimes it's not about, yeah, I know how to make a meal. Once, it's, once I have all the ingredients in front of me, I know how to make it. It's something that's about, sometimes about choosing the meal. So. If you had a list of options to choose from, you can always do the whole eeny, meeny, miny, mo or random selection on, off your list. It's, up, it's really up to you. Some people like to kind of poll their family. What do you guys want to eat? If you ask a, a small child, though, they might say tacos every night, so just be careful. Um, 
if you have, if your mom has some great recipes that you know and you haven't made for a while, give her a call and get the recipes from her. It can make it a little bit easier. You can also use something called a pick list, which means that you write out kind of options that you can make, and then you again you do the whole blind selection process with that. You can also make a pick list for just simple items in the store. So sometimes it's just about trying to choose the right salad dressing. There are 176 in the store. We have counted them. So that's a lot of choices to make, right? So if you know you have to go in for a salad dressing and you have three options to choose from, you can then ignore the rest of the ones that are on the shelf. Some people love their phones and their tablets. So there are some meal planners online or there are some meal planner apps as well. Most times they cost money. And just be prepared because most times if it costs money, you have to input all the recipes into your meal plan in order for it to be very time effective and efficient. So there's a lot of upfront work and if you're not comfortable with technology or if you find it, it's very laborsome, then it might not be the best fit for you. And they usually cost about two or three dollars, so they're not cheap apps either. Um, so d but again, if you have all the recipes input already, then you can always just hit repeat or select the recipe you want and then it can plug it into your meal plan for you. So again, upfront work, reap the benefits down the line, it's up to you. Michael's Arts and Crafts also has kind of pads of eat sheets that are like little mouse pad size. That again, they just have days of the week and a grocery list attached to it, so you can help out. It can help you out with that. If you find that going to the grocery store is really, really that horrible, and you're like, I cannot step foot in the store ever again, I need another alternative. There is online shopping, so it goes through Sobeys and the University of Western Ontario, I believe. Um, and what it is, it costs eight dollars for this service, and you order your groceries online, and they deliver them. They have a certain depending on where you are in the city, so it's only for in London folks, depending on where you are in the city, it'll have a delivery time. So if you're in the southeast end, it might be you have Wednesday afternoons will be your delivery time. So you have to be home for it. But they have everything that's cold packaged in the cold area, and they have everything that's kind of dry goods is in a dry goods bag, and they bring it, pop it in your house, take their $8, and you pay the bill, and that's it. All done. So it's a good alternative for people who can't get out. Or again, if you know someone who can't even leave the house anymore, then that's also a good alternative to get groceries in the house. If you're really strapped for ideas, if you're like, yeah, I made Sloppy Joe's again, I'm out of ideas, here are some other ideas you can look at. Um, Craft Kitchen sends out a magazine in the mail. I think it costs money now. It used to be free, but now it costs money. It's called the What's Cooking magazine. And the milk calendar, I believe, comes in some magazines and newspapers still. So you can always access all the stuff online. Um, beware of Pinterest. If you're going to go on Pinterest, look up recipes. Not everything turns out as yummy as that picture looks. Family members, coworkers, friends, they're great ways to find new recipes. And again, if you have a busy day, try and use your slow cooker. It's kind of like cruise control. You put it in, set it, and forget it. And then you come home and it's all done. Just be careful because sometimes the digital ones, you need to actually be there to push start. So if you have it on a timer, it won't actually start because you're not there to push the button to start it. Whereas the old fashioned knobby ones will start. And some people also say, thanks Becky for the tips on meal planning. I got that covered. But I have trouble with actually making a recipe. So someone gives me a new recipe and I can't follow the instructions. Or I get lost in the instructions. I forget if I put ingredients in the bowl or not. I put too much baking soda in. My cake looked like this. And so usually what I recommend is that if you have a page protector or a plastic sleeve, slide your recipe into a page protector and use a dry erase marker and cross off things as you go. So if you've added an ingredient, cross it off. Another idea is, if you this, is, this, this one is from Pinterest, is you take a pants hanger, you know the, the hangers that little kids' pants come on? You can take that and clamp it onto your little plastic sheet and you can hang it from a cupboard door. So you're not looking down on the paper and then looking up at your recipe and then down on the paper. And you're actually going to have it at eye level so you don't have to keep changing the focus. Some people, it's the, it's the changing of focus that causes a big headache as well when you're cooking. Um, I've also recommended in the past that if you're taking all the ingredients out anyway, bring them all out, put them on the counter. As you add them, transfer them to the other side of the bowl. That way you know things over here have been done, things over here have not been done yet. Or put them away as you go. That way you know what if it's put back in the fridge again, you've already put it in there. Nothing worse than putting two scoops of baking soda in your cake. So we talked about meal planning. Um, many of the skills developed when you do meal planning can also be applied to other things. So I'm all about planning ahead and trying to plan, plan for the worst. Um, but don't try and plan it in your head. Get out a piece of paper, any paper will do, and draw something out or write something down. It gets it kind of out from the ping pong ball that's bouncing around inside onto something that's more concrete. 
and that concrete thing you can pick up, put in your pocket, and bring with you wherever you go. What if you need to plan out something though and you don't know where to start? That's another good question that people ask me a lot. Where do I begin? So a lot of my job is to take large, insurmountable tasks and break them into little tiny pieces so that people can get them done and be successful with them. Um, each of those little tasks can be planned out in your, in your agenda book, let's say, and it also allows you to put deadlines in place or divide things up so they're actually going to fit with what you can tolerate for the day. So if you can only tolerate 45 minutes of, let's say, making a cake, I'm not gonna make you make a cake, ice the cake, and make and deliver it to, I don't know, the Girl Guide meeting tonight, right? All in one day. I'm gonna have you break it up into three different days to do that. Planning things out can also help you stay on track. So if you find that you get kind of lost or you're doing a big project and you're getting kind of lost in it, planning it out into little sections can actually keep you kind of on task and keep you going, keep that task going along. And it also lowers your stress level a little, a little bit. This is the other one. And what it does is it allows you to take a large goal and for all my friends who, are, do not, who don't like visually stimulating ideas, this is very, uh, kind of a busy page sometimes. So you could always just take a blank piece of paper, write a goal across the top, and break, five, break it down into five different things. So you don't need to use this sheet necessarily. So let's say you have to clean out your living closet. That can be a big job, right? I, I haven't tackled mine yet because there's a lot of blankets and sheets and stuff in there I don't really want to don't really do this. And I don't really feel like taking it all out and folding it all again and washing it. So let's say you want to clean out your linen closet though. So to keep me on track, I'm going to break it down into five easy steps. So maybe I take out the top shelf first. So I'm going to take out the items on the top shelf. I might clean in there as well a little bit, get rid of some dust bunnies. And so that would be the first step. Second step is I'm going to maybe toss out the stuff I don't need anymore. Third step, maybe I'm going to wash some stuff that hasn't been washed for a little while. The fourth step might be to fold it all up again and the fifth step to put it back in again. So keep that in mind that if you can get one shelf done, that's a success, right? It doesn't have to be the whole thing in one fell swoop. Technology can also help. So there's a couple apps that are listed here that can help keep you on track for tasks. The Can Plan app is actually one that was developed by someone who has a brain injury for other people who have brain injuries. So it's about trying to take a task, let's say, of making coffee, and if you can't remember the steps to make the coffee, put the filter in, all that stuff, then you can have someone take pictures of it and put text with it. So take out the filter, put it in here. You might not need it divided up into that much detail, but it could be that if you want to plan out something that's bigger than that, you could take pictures of it along the way. The 30 slash 30 app is actually one that has a built-in timer, so it will tell, it'll keep you on track because it will tell you when to switch. And the to-do app is a way of organizing a whole bunch of projects together, so it's more of a productivity app, and it does cost a little bit of money, so I think it's about $10, but it's a pretty heavy-duty one to keep you on track for activities. And you can have success, so again, dividing it up could enable you to have some success in your life versus, oh, I didn't get the whole linen closet cleaned out, and it didn't work again. So trying, again, trying to get those little, little bits in there that are completed, done well, and you can kind of do a little checkbox in your, in your agenda. And you have to celebrate that because even though you might not have gotten the whole thing done, you got, you got the part you need to get done, done that day, and you can move on to the next one tomorrow. So some more strategies people ask me about, well, what happens if I lose my stuff all over the house? What should I do about that? So I'm constantly, especially for the guys. So girls usually have a purse. We put all our stuff in our purse. So if we drop the purse, at least we know what all our stuff's inside it. Um, but guys, they can tend to have, they have a bunch of stuff they have to carry around in their pockets and stuff. So it's about cell phones, wallets, keys, so what I have recommended to some of the guys is that they have a little basket maybe that when you walk in the front door you unload all your stuff out of your pockets into a basket and then you know that's always going to be there. So when you have to leave the house again, oh, you just load back up and away you go. Whereas girls, again, if you have a purse, put your purse in the same spot all the time. Otherwise you could end up losing that in the house. And if something worse than having your phone on vibrate and you're calling it, trying to find your phone in your purse and you can't hear it anyway because it's just vibrating in there. So. It's one way of keeping, keeping an eye on things. You can also use alarms and timers. So some of the appliances you have in your house probably have bells, like the fridge, it will beep at you if you leave it open. Uh, the washing machine also will beep at you when things are done, or the dryer. And that way you can't forget it. And using a checklist. So if you find that you're packing the same thing, if you have to pack a lot, and you're packing the same things all the time into, um, let's say, a, a kid's lunch, or you're packing something for an overnight, and you find that you're always forgetting the same things, having a checklist can also be very beneficial. I recommend if you're gonna reuse checklists to laminate them 
and put them, again, with the item you're going to pack. So if you always pack a suitcase and you always forget your toothbrush, then have a checklist in your suitcase that you, have to, you can check off with a dry erase marker. You can wipe it clean when you're done, and you can throw it in your suitcase and have it for next time as well. My door is um, metal, so I have magnets all over my door, and I can put a note on my door. So I remember to bring my potluck item or my pie or something like that. Um, if this fails, I tell people you, you usually have a backup for your backup. So if you're really prone to forgetting things, taping something to your steering wheel can also be very beneficial, or leaving a note on your car seat. So when you get in, you're like, oh, oh yeah, the pie, and you have to go back in again, even though you walked right by the first note. Um, if you find that you're losing your keys a lot, having an automatic entry into your house can be very beneficial because your keys may very well be inside your house. Um, you can always give a spare key to a trusted neighbor as well or a family member. Who here uses a whiteboard or a dry erase board? Yeah? So that can be very beneficial as well. I, having one by the entryway or near a common place where people have to communicate in a household is very, very beneficial or next to the phone so you can write phone messages on it. Um, so the whiteboard can be a great asset. If you don't have one now, you might want to invest in one. They're not pretty, necessarily, but they do work. Um, this is another Pinterest idea. If you find that they're so repulsive that you can't possibly ever put one up in your house, you can always take a picture frame that has glass in it and put a piece of paper behind it and use, hang that up, and you can write on the picture frame. So we're going to switch gears a little bit. So I don't want you guys to fall asleep on me, but we're going to talk about a little bit sleeping now and sleep hygiene, because that's also very important. So sleep is a huge complaint for many of our patients. Um, sometimes there is an underlying physiology kind of dictating that you're not having a good sleep. So you may have a physiological condition like sleep apnea or something like that that's making sleep very difficult for you. I can't help you with that, um, but you can certainly speak with your doctor. If you find that your sleep is really horrible after maybe a few months of trying to do sleep hygiene, then perhaps talk to your family doctor about um, next steps um, with sleep might be an option as well for you. Sleep hygiene is not about being clean when you go to bed. <laughs> it's not about having a shower first. It's about cleaning up your sleep routine. Okay, so having a good kind of sleep structure or sleep schedule um, under your belt. And we're going to talk a little, a little bit about that today. So the first thing is I want you to try and get routine sleep and wake times. So this is really bad for people who do shift, shift work. So that they're never routine, right? They're routine for a week and they shift off again. Um, so we're trying to look at your body's natural circadian rhythm or your body's natural sleep and wake cycles. It usually falls around that natural sunset and sunrise. That's when the sleep cycles happen. Um, so trying to stick with those cycles, even on the weekends, is really important because everyone likes sleeping in on the weekends, right? So it's really hard to get out of that habit. So even an hour, like in an hour afterwards, like if you wake up on the weekend an hour later, that's not, not, not such a big deal. But if you sleep in for four or five hours later on the weekend, that might affect that night's sleep. Okay, so keep that in mind. Also think about how you wake up. Do you wake up naturally, just open your eyes and get up? Or does something go and jar you out of bed, right? So it all depends on how you wake up. There's a lot of different kinds of alarm clocks on the market now. Um, again, if you have a smartphone, there's everything under the sun when it comes to alarm clocks. But they actually make light alarm clocks now where it's actually a light that comes on in your room and it gets brighter and brighter as the time comes along when you're supposed to wake up. I don't know if I'd trust that if you had to get up for a very important appointment because I could easily just cover my head with my blanket and then the light goes away. Um, some of them also have a smell that goes with it. So the light starts coming on and then the smell of coffee starts brewing. Or you can actually set your alarm on your coffee maker to start brewing and then you're like, oh, what's that burning? Because you forgot to put the pot or anything. No. Um, so keep in mind that there's many different kinds of things that can wake you up. Or again, jarring beep versus radio. If you find you're going to sleep through the radio, then the jarring beep has to be used. But the more natural way you can wake up, the better. So if you can wake up just on your own, probably the best way. The second thing to look at is how, how you kind of prepare for sleep. So establishing a relaxing bedtime routine. So I want you to try and listen to soothing music. You can have a hot bath. Some people use Epsom salts or lavender smells because supposedly that helps with inducing some sleep, sleepiness. You can read a book as well. Some people find that reading a book is stimulating, so they're not going to read a book if it's going to wake you up again. Um, some people find that reading is just fatiguing or gives them a headache, so don't do that either because you don't want to go to bed with a headache either. And be careful how you're reading a book now because now we have all this technology out there. There's a difference between reading a paper book 
and reading a tablet book and reading an e-reader book. So if you do have one of those devices, an e-reader uses e-ink, it's not shining at you. So it's kind of like you have to have a light on in order to see it. A tablet or some of the colored e-readers, they have a light that's actually shining at you. Most of the light that's coming at you is blue light. Blue light tells your brain to wake up. So it's probably not the best idea. If you do find that you have to read on a tablet, or it's the only way you have access to your e-books and you have a whole collection of them, you can always turn the device into nighttime mode, which is a black background and white text. So it's not actually shining that much blue light at you, just a little bit. Um, keep in mind as well that sometimes having a relaxation technique can also help with starting the sleepiness to come on for you. So some people use progressive muscle relaxation, meditations. Um, if you have trouble falling asleep, sometimes it's your thoughts or kind of what I have to do tomorrow, your worries, sometimes those things come about. Social work will talk more about that in two sessions from now. So kind of how to park some of those thoughts so you don't have to worry about them keeping you up at night. I want you to create a sleep friendly environment as well. So it's not going to be in the, the party room of the house. You're going to have it dark if you can. So if you have curtains, draw them. Um, even a little bit of light from outside because the snow reflects the light right now. So if the moon is out and the snow is there, it's going to reflect the moonlight into your house. Um, if you find that the curtains aren't dark enough, then you can always use one of those little eye shades as well. You want to have a quiet environment. So if you find that if it's too quiet, you hear all the creaks and the bumps and the dog rolling over and snorting and those kinds of things, then you might want to have a white noise maker going on. So that could be a fan. They actually make sleep sound makers, which are like static noises or birds chirping or a bubbling brook or something like that. They're not very expensive. So if you're interested in something like that, I think they sell them at Walmart even for a noise maker. Um, you want it to be very comfortable in your room as well, so a little bit cooler than the rest of your house. And if you find that the clock is something that gives you a little bit of anxiety because you keep looking at it saying, why am I not asleep yet? Oh my, another hour's gone by, why am I still not asleep? Then get the clock out of the room or turn it face down or face a wall or something else so that you're not looking at the clock. And the worst part is I'm going to ask you not to bring your device in with you to the room. So cell phones, TVs, tablets, out the door. So, because those things can be very distracting. Even on vibrate, you, in the middle of the night, you have this thing beside you on your bedside table, it's going to vibrate at least once, I guarantee it. You're going to have a good mattress and pillow. Sometimes that can make all the difference. Um, they say mattresses only last about 10 years. Now, I can't go out myself every 10 years and buy a brand new mattress, so, but if yours is going on the 40 year mark, it might be time to switch it up a little bit. Um, a pillow can make a huge, huge difference as well. They say that Best Western sells the best pillows and they actually do sell them at the hotel across the street. So if you're interested in Best Western pillow, they sell them from their store. Um, some people do a lot of other activities in the bedroom, like their income taxes or crossword puzzles. So the bedroom really should be for sleep and in intimacy only. This helps strengthen the, the association between the act of sleeping and the room you're doing it in. So things that cause stress, like the clock shouldn't really be in the room anymore with you, or doing things that aren't really sleep related, like manicures or anything like that, then that can, that can be done in the bathroom, somewhere else. If you find that you have to eat before bed, try and have a light snack. Um, you should really try and finish eating a big meal about two or three hours before you go to bed, because then what happens is you lay down flat and then you start getting a little bit of reflux, maybe from, if you had something spicy especially. Try to limit your fluid intake before bed as well because that causes you to wake up frequently to go to the bathroom. They say warm milk with molasses in it is a good technique from long ago. I don't know how true that is. Some people do report that warm milk puts, makes them sleepy, so they go to sleep easier. Um, keep in mind that if you're going to have a tea, it should be non-caffeinated or decaf tea. Even green tea has caffeine in it, so be careful that you're not drinking a green tea before bed because it can actually wake you up again. Um, I got no alcohol. It might cause a temporary drowsiness, but it doesn't last forever. No cigarettes if you're a smoker, because they are actually a stimulant. And some foods can be actually hard to digest. So I've heard that if you eat popcorn before bed, it can be kind of gurgling in your stomach a lot because your body's trying to break it down. Spicy food, again, causes reflux sometimes. Cheese can be hard to break down. So just keep in mind as to what you're eating before bed. So, and again, if you're going to pop a chocolate before bed, you might get some funky dreams, but you might not go to sleep very easily. If you exercise regularly, um, 
Again, trying to complete your workout a few hours before bed. Earlier in the day is better. Now, I just read a study, I think it was on CTV News, that that's a myth now, I guess. There was one study that said that that whole idea of that an exercise program is going to wake you up again is a myth. So keep that in mind. Um, but a little bit of light exercise in the beginning of the day can actually make you prepared to go to sleep that night. So that can actually drain up some of your energy or make it so that your, your body's kind of on the right clock again. And again, avoiding caffeine. So Red Bulls, Monsters, coffee, those kinds of things are kind of the obvious ones. But again, some carbonated, brevet, car carbonated drinks have caffeine in them too. So Mountain Dew in the States is caffeinated, so be careful. It can be the green, the green yuck. Um, colas and root beers, some of them have caffeine in them as well. Green tea again, chocolate, those kinds of things. So just keep that in mind. They can actually remain in your body for about three to five hours. So even though you have one at supper time, like an espresso maybe, that might not be out of your system by the time you go to bed at 10. Some people take melatonin, magnesium supplements. There's a lot of stuff on the market for sleep. Sleep is kind of like the plague of our nation right now. Um, be careful what you're buying. There's a lot, you can sink a lot of money into stuff that doesn't actually have any efficacy for you. So again, speak with your pharmacist, speak with your naturalist, speak with your doctor, speak with your dietitian, someone. Because um, even though it's over the counter, it could interfere with some of the medication you're taking right now. It could also interfere with other things that you're taking for sleep or make it too much. There is some discussion that sunlight therapy, so getting out in the sun when it's daytime is important because that sets your kind of natural clock in sync with the sun. Um, they actually make special sun lamps now that you sit in front of and it gives you the same effect. Again, be careful what you're investing your money in because they can be quite expensive.